Hey, 4 C Divers! Thank you for tuning in. This is a very special presentation for us because we are coming to you live in our classroom because we've got people here that are going to watch the presentation along with you, all the people at home. I know some of you guys don't live close enough to get down here, so we wanted to make sure that this presentation was available for you because it is a fantastic topic. And we've got Adam Nardelli here. Adam, say hi. Hey, guys. All right, and we're going to be talking about the invasive lionfish, and we're going to let um, Adam do the PowerPoint presentation and talk. But just remember, guys, it is May, and it is our spearfishing month, so make sure that you go online, check out our spearfishing page, and come out and do some dives with us. We have a lionfish derby June 11th. If you want to get another person, two team, or two person team, come out. Kill some lionfish, win some prizes. If you want more information about that, go on our website, www.force-e.com. All right. So, hey, everybody. Hey, guys. <laughs> All, right. All right. Adam, Thanks take the floor. All right. So, uh, before I begin, again, my name is Adam Nardelli. How many people here are already lionfish hunters? Awesome. Okay. Lionfish have been around for a while, so there are people who are consider themselves expert hunters for now, and I designed this presentation to kind of uh, touch base with those hunters that are already hunting and people who have never hunted lionfish before. So I'm going to, there's two parts to this. I'm going to go into the history of the invasion here in South Florida and the Caribbean, talking a little bit about, about the natural history of lionfish. And then the second part, I'm going to talk about the control and the removal. And uh, it's sort of like a walk down memory lane for me because I've been working with lionfish for a long time. And uh, I'll talk about what we knew, what we learned, and what's going to work for the future. So, all right. Oh, you have to change it this way too. Okay. <laughs> I didn't. I thought it was in sync. I saw that change. There we go. I don't know, it's weird. Um, all right, so a little bit about my background. I'm a paddy uh, scuba instructor and dive master. I've worked a lot for 10 years as a dive master on scuba time. Um, I'm a high school marine science teacher today. And uh, I graduated from Nova Southeastern Oceanographic Center um, studying uh, fishery science, uh, marine science, and uh, I'm a former reef intern. Now, uh, by the way, all these pictures here, it's funny, because thanks to Google, um, uh, I didn't actually have these on file, and I was just looking at me and lionfish, and all this stuff came up. So really, like I said, I've been working with lionfish for a while. Um, this right here is one of the studies that I started. Another um, colleague that was in my fisheries lab took over the study and published it. Um, I, From the beginning of the invasion, and we were doing lionfish derbies, I was interested in uh, the socioeconomics of the, the people who are coming to fish for lionfish and how does it support the community and is this an, a movement that can be sustainable to uh, uh, continue control of the invasion um so we did find that people came from all over not just local areas uh to, to support the lionfish removal efforts and brought a lot of money in and the catch effort was pretty good um this is one of the first prototypes of the zookeeper um, and they had a, uh, they put like a plastic in the front, plexiglass so that you can see your, your lionfish in there. Um, I did a lot of stuff for outreach at different events. So it's been, it's been a long history with lionfish. What if you hit the keyboard? The keyboard's not working. Oh, um, all right. So let's just do a quick little test here. All of these species can be found here in South Florida. How many of them are native and how many are not native? So when we look at these, how many do you think there's more than two species that are native there? How many people think there's uh, more than three, well, uh, less than two species native? Okay, why do you, why'd you raise your hand for that? I don't think any of them are native. Yeah, um, none of these are native here to South Florida. They're everywhere in, here in South Florida. Um, and so we're going to talk about what makes a species native and what makes a species non-native or invasive is another term. Um, flamingos, everybody thinks of Florida and flamingos. And they have lawn uh, displays of plastic flamingos. Um, 
Flamingos did have a larger home range here before we uh, took over their habitat and urbanized much of uh, South Florida. There is still a corridor pocket where they're transient in Southwest Florida in the mangroves over there, but they used to have a much broader range here. It's just, we took it over. So they've been kind of um, displaced. So there, so there are species that did transient through here, but now there's no room for them. Um, peacocks, they're not from here and we have them here. Um, marine toads, they're all over. Um, papayas are not native from here, but they're delicious, right? Um, Cuban um, uh, frogs, uh, we've got parrots, Burmese pythons, armadillos, are native to North America, but not to Florida. And they came in um, a long time ago during a change of sea level. Um, and and they, they've basically expanded all of their range up Central America into North America. Um, Iguana is definitely invasive and not native. And then uh, this is Australian pine, which is a really big problem here, but everybody plants it um, because for aesthetic reasons. So there's lots of different species here in Florida. Um, Florida has over 500 fish and other wildlife non-native species. Uh, I love this image here. There's Mickey right there um, looking at the hazmat guys trying to get rid of all the invasive species. Um, so what is a native species? Uh, a native species is a species that historically occurred or currently occurs in that ecosystem, not by means of an introduction. So there's historical reference that it was always there. It gets pretty complex when you talk about places that are like islands uh, that develop as seamounts from the middle Pacific, like Hawaii, because all of those species colonized that area and, and when it formed, there were no native species there. So, you know, th there's, there's gray areas to that term, but a non-native species, also known as introduced, alien, exotic, non-indigenous or naturalized, refers to organisms introduced to an area outside of their native range. So any species that's relocated from its native habitat to a non-native habitat is now a non-native species. It's not really uh, known what it's going to do in its new habitat yet. So at this point, it's now an introduced species. As introduced species arrive as non-native, um, they evolve in one place and they were transported to a new ecological community brought by people either intentionally or unintentionally. So uh, like it, they, the organisms can be just uh, carried along in ships in the ballast or as stowaways if like rats um, or snakes uh, and in, in unintentionally brought in or people brought their culture with them when they came to new places and they intentionally brought plants and other animals that reminded them of their home to North America. Um, and then for other reasons, we try to control uh, non-native species with their native species from their homeland. So we brought them in as well. So it's pretty complex of how we move species. This is a big problem that we created ourselves because we are homogenizing the world's biodiversity by moving all these species around. And we'll see that it's had some unintended consequences, especially with the lionfish. Um, most introduced species fail to establish populations, but the ones that thrive and flourish are called invasive species. Um, introductions can be useful, like crop plants or livestock that have been brought in. So some introductions could have positive benefits. Oh, Nicole, are you, are you changing with me? Sorry, read that one. Okay, next one. So an invasive species is something else. Other introductions may be directly harmful to the environment. It's considered invasive when an alien species whose introduction does or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm to human health. Um, they can, I refer to them as biological pollutants uh, because we think of pollution as chemical or physical waste. But when we bring in these organisms that are causing harm to the environment, um, it's another form of pollution. Um, so examples here in uh, Florida as well are kudzu. Um, all of Southeast United States are covered with these massive vine plants. And when you actually see kudzu just take over trees, it's impressive. When I drive up 95 to go up to uh, New York, you can see some areas just covered in it. Um, cane toads or marine toads are not only here in Florida, they're also invasive to Australia, and that's caused a big problem there. Um, zebra mussels took over Lake Michigan. Um, however, the positive benefit is that 
uh, because of all the eutrophication that was in Lake Michigan, which means that there is an excess amount of fertilizers and nutrients, um, that water was pretty much toxic before zebra mussels got in there. Zebra mussels being powerful uh, filter feeders cleaned up all the water of the Great Lakes and now they're crystal clear, but they just overgrow everything and they spread uh, through the tributaries of the Great Lakes through other rivers. Um, the, in a study that I read, cost to US funds totaled $138 billion per year in damages, losses, and control measures. So yes, the government does look at this because this is a big problem economically and uh, environmentally. And we don't want to pay for uh, cleanup, okay? The, the important part is to prevent this from happening. All right, so invasive species pose threats to community stability. Introduced species become invasive when limiting factors in their environment that normally regulate their population growth are absent. Um, in their native environments, they've had a ch or the community has had a chance to evolve with that species. So all of the natural restraints that keep the species populations in checks uh, and checks and balance are put on that species. But when you take that species out of its native environment and put it somewhere else, it's completely novel to the new community. Evolution hasn't worked there yet. So its population is growing beyond what we call carrying capacity. And it, it just overgrows and takes over that way. So what, what are these factors that normally keep populations in check? Competition, predators, parasites. So in the non-native range, we see a lack of competition, a lack of predators or parasites that affect them in their uh, former native ranges. This gives these invaders an advantage over new community species. And I'll talk about that for the life specifically in a minute. So how do they arrive? Um, there could be natural range expansions or disturbance events like changes in sea level might allow corridors or pathways for species to expand. Um, or a, a big hurricane storm might blow species in uh, and raft them into other areas and islands. Um, so there are natural examples of species moving around. Um, but in introduction, uh, the intentional or unintentional escape, release, dissemination, or placement of a species in an ecosystem is usually the result of human activity. Oranges are not native to Florida, but we're the citrus state, right? Or at least we used to be before the crop failures. But um, oranges, in fact, even though they're flourishing, flourishing in Europe as well, are actually native to Asia. So they've been brought all over the world. Um, ship ballast water, this is a big problem. Um, it's actually caused some international regulations and laws to form because now ships have to exchange their ballast water out in the ocean so many miles before they come in. Why do they have to do that? Because what's floating around in this ballast water that they're carrying? All the larvae, all the juveniles of species from that native area that will have time to mature while they're hanging out in that ballast water. And then when they release their ballast water in the port, they just dumped all the larvae and juveniles of that species into the new area. So now there's regulations preventing it from doing that. If you're not sure, like in the, all these uh, port freighter ships, they exchange ballast because they're trying to take in cargo and the weight of the ship is going to be different when, whether they have cargo on them or it's moved off. So they have to suck in water to replace the weight of the cargo so they maintain the proper uh, ballast and sea level. Um, and then, of course, just aquarium release, um, which can be intentional or sometimes unintentional. But most of the time, people let go of their pets. And that's been the case for most of South Florida's uh, non-native introduced species. I'm going this way. <laughs> Sorry, which one is changing? Okay, so there are certain stages of the invasion process. They don't just happen overnight. Although, in, like in the case of the lionfish, usually by the time they're noticed, and they're already established. And at that point, their numbers are going to rapidly increase. The time that you want to stop it is here. As you move down the arrows, it gets harder and harder and harder to remove the invader. So the, at the first stage is transport, where we have uptake and transfer of the organism. Once it gets transported to the new area and it, it releases and it's surviving in that new area, it's now considered an introduction. We still have a good chance of getting rid of it when it's just an introduced species. But when one species 
that's a male sees the female and they mate and they start a, a becoming a reproducing population, now we have establishment. We've established the colony of that species and, and we have a growing population of, of a non-native species here. From that point, from that establishment place, it's now a stepping stone to be transported to other reef habitats. And pay attention to this because this is exactly what happened with the lionfish invasion. There's no better clear cut example. Um, and I'll go over the exact pathways of how it did in a moment. Um, so each phase is, it, um, can have um, the ability to be stopped up to establishment. So we are a non-native hotspot here in South Florida. Um, Part of the reason is when you think about our ecosystem and our climate here, it is very conducive to be the home to almost any species. We're warm, we've got lots of water, we've got lots of food. Uh, species do very well here. We have monkeys, we have, um, like I said, parrots. We've got even um, tegus, which are a new uh, big monitor lizard that are taking over the Everglades. I mean, anything, you name it, it will survive here in South Florida. I guess unless it needs really like cold adapted environments. Um, but these are just some of the uh, marine species that have been spotted right here in our South Florida waters. Um, there are 31 marine fish species that are non-native that have been observed. This is from um, the USGS um, information. Um, there are seven urihaline species, which means species that can go from fresh to salt water, like um, snakeheads, um, walking catfish, um, and then the only real established species still for the past almost 15 years is the red lionfish. Um, now, Nicole and I actually went diving. We saw this elephant tang and I said, should I spear it? And then we both agreed underwater that it's an herbivore and we've, it's only the one we've ever seen. We're like, we're going to leave it because we need more herbivores on our reefs, to be honest. Um, and he hangs out at that, this one spot. Every time I go to the, this, what was it? Turtle ledge? I think it was Turtle Ledge. He's always there at this one spot. And he hangs out with the other uh, surgeon fish and the grunts. Um, so we let him stay. But uh, fairy basslets, they are, it's uh, interesting, their, their range is all of the Caribbean, except for Florida. And so they're in the Bahamas. If you go diving in the Bahamas, you'll see lots of fairy basslets. They're one of my favorite fish. They like to hang up uh, upside down under crevices. Um, there was a year probably about maybe 50, 10, 2008, I want to say it was, or 2007, I was seeing fairy basilids on, uh, on the reefs all over, and nobody believed me. And then I think they did a study on it, and there is a corridor that came off of the Gulf Stream that brought them from the Bahamas into our waters as larvae. And then they developed, and they, they didn't stay here um, because a lot of times on species, like I said, when they get introduced, it's not the, it, they don't have the ability to survive there. The conditions aren't right. So they will, they will live until the end of their life, but they can't reproduce or some environmental change will happen and they all die. Um, so there's lots of different species to be on the lookout for here when you're diving. Okay, so the lionfish is the perfect invader. It's the only one out of all of those that's really been able to establish itself. Um, I'm not gonna lie, the first time I learned about the lionfish was in the movie Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, um, when he put him in the blender and he had a mishap with the lionfish in the, I'm not going to say anything. Anyways, um, so they're in family scorpionity, which makes them scorpion fishes. If you know anything about a scorpion fish or just the idea of a scorpion, that means that they sting. They have venom. Um, we do have native scorpion fish here. So they are uh, distant cousins, uh, but they, are, they don't really act or have the same ecological niche as the lionfish. It's just they share that venom. Um, Two species uh, of lionfish uh, are the ones that are responsible for the invasion. They look almost identically the same. There are a few differences and there are some genetic differences um, that, that, that you can tease them out with. But Terois volatans, which makes it the, do uh, the dominant of all of them, and Terois miles are the two species of lionfish that have taken over this red area here. So all throughout um, the eastern seaboard of North America, down to Florida, the Gulf of Mexico, all the Caribbean, Bermuda. They are starting now to expand the range into Brazil. 
Um, and then this at the time was a star because they were just starting to see observations of lionfish in the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal, but now they are also taking over the Mediterranean. And so scientists that have worked with lionfish in um, the Western Atlantic are trying to apply what has worked to help scientists in the Mediterranean. Um, they have, of course, some governmental differences and issues that makes it harder for them. And if you've ever been diving in the Mediterranean, it's really not the same. Um, so that can make it logistically hard as well. Um, but so this is the territory of Torres Miles, uh, mostly comes from the Indian Ocean. And then Torres Volatans is a Pacific uh, species. Both have been released. And because they both look very similar to each other, um, that kind of, when you see when I talk about the introduction, um, that'll go into why two different species were released. Um, all right, so you guys know, I'll talk about him in a second, but 1986, let me, I can, don't think I can pause it, I'll have to come back. Um, 1986 was the first reported um, release of a lionfish in the Western Atlantic. And does anyone know where it was? Dania Beach, Florida, right here. Okay, it's gonna let this play again. So in 1986 is when we have the first record. Now there have been, I had read anecdotal uh, reports of the late 70s people finding lionfish and releasing them, but 1986, right off Dania Beach, Florida. Look how long we have though. We have a few years go by, about six more years. Now we start to see a little bit more Miami. 92 was Hurricane Andrew. And then they stay relatively localized. Not many, then it hits Bermuda and it goes up to, believe it or not, Virginia and the Carolinas. Then it starts to spread all through the Bahamas, down through the Caribbean, and it takes over the Southern Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, and then lastly ends up back to the Florida Keys. So this is the journey that lionfish have taken. Now, why do I have uh, Gizmo here, if you know anything about the Gremlins, great movie, because I consider the invasion story of lionfish like Gizmo. When, remember, the, these lionfish, we think that they were released because of the aquarium trade. People had them as a pet and they let them go. Why would they let them go? Because lionfish are predators. They are carnivores. They like to eat things and they grow really well in captivity. So somebody had a lionfish when it was about this big in their tank. And over time it grew this big and this big. And then it started eating all of their expensive saltwater fish in their tanks. And that, so what do you do with Lenny the lionfish? You don't want to kill Lenny the lionfish and put him in the toilet. First of all, it's expensive fish. And that's, Len that's your boy, Lenny. So they take them in a, in a net and they say, go be free and enjoy the ocean and swim with all the other fish out there. Well, if one person did it, 10 other and then 100 other people have done it. And eventually, Lenny the lionfish meets Lisa the lionfish. And now we have established a reproductive population. Um, so the idea with Gizmo is that when they brought Gizmo home, you know, they said, okay, you can keep him by himself, take, keep him as a pet. They gave them rules about Gizmo. But then once those rules were broken, they turned to gremlins, which just kept reproducing and taking over. So all the lionfish from that point are the gremlins of that original Lenny the lionfish. Um, the reason why they spread around this way, I'm going to come back to, but can anybody think of what would connect all of these areas together? to help the lionfish move around? Right. Exactly, yep, I'll come back to that. Okay, so I, 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 made, I started a presentation like this in 2014 and I had a slide that had a bunch of news he headings about it. So I thought it'd be fun to see where have they come since then. So in 2014, um, they were already making huge headlines. Lionfish bash helps control invasive species in South Florida. Um, Fight intensifies against lionfish. Invasive species threaten ecosystems. Lionfish is the new terminator of the sea. Lion, the media has a frenzy over lionfish. And they love to talk about it and they, and they love to highlight it. Years later, we're still seeing this, but in new ways now. Um, and we're still talking about the voracious and invasive lionfish taking over the Atlantic. Lionfish menace continues from the Sun Sentinel. That was just in 2021. <laughs> Excuse me. But now even the mass singer came out as a lionfish singer. OK, so it's making the mass singer now. Um, then we've got new contraptions being created to help with the invasion. Um, I thought this one was just hilarious. The Roomba of the sea. It's a lionfish zapper that um, that basically stung uh, uh, stuns the lionfish with a zap. And then it, it's a submer It's a it's a little ROV. 
um, and it sucks up the lionfish after it's zapped. So there's all different gimmicks. It's still a heightened frenzy. People go crazy over lionfish. Is that something you can buy, or is that something that like big companies do? You know, don't zap her. I haven't seen the uh, ability to buy it. It was just uh, researchers that were using it okay. and, and trying to control them. Um, they're probably trying to sell them to governments to use them. Um, okay, so back to the establishment and the introduction. So when we, when we watched the jump from Florida, in 92, there was Hurricane Andrew. So we think that was responsible for a couple of aquariums being destroyed near the ocean and letting them be released. But it goes from Bermuda to uh, the Carolinas. There, from there, it re they really take a footing. And then the Bahamas gives them the launch they need to get through the Caribbean. And we already said, what do we think does this? What helps them with that are the currents from the Gulf Stream. So if this is a thermal image of the Gulf Stream here, and you can see all the little eddies that create corridors. So if lionfish were released here, the lionfish had a moving highway that carried them up to Bermuda, and then uh, eddies can funnel off, and they took over the reefs near the Carolinas. And then from there, they found their way back down to the, uh, the Bahamas. Now, when we think about the lionfish moving around, it's really not the adult lionfish. They do swim and they move around, but they don't move around that much. They don't have the potential to carry huge ocean distances like this. Another part of their lifestyle and, and, and it is what has been on the move. It's their larvae. So these corridors are transporting the lionfish larvae, not the adults, um, as they relocate to the new locations. All right, so this uh, graph here shows um, the invasion process. Lionfish fit this model uh, very well. Um, and it also tells us where what we can do to control them and where is the lionfish now. So when we first see an invader, um, we don't really see it when, it when it shows up. There's a lag time between the time it's been introduced to when it's really starting to rapidly appear. Like I showed you, 1986 to 1992, there was just a couple of them. And then overnight, almost, they took off. So that's the problem with these introduction events. We don't see it until it's already here and it's happened. So if, if you see a bunch of them, they've already been around for a good period of time. Um, the invasion, after it gets through its exponential growth phase, will have a peak. This is in what we, what we call in classic ecology would be something similar to carrying capacity, but there really is no carrying capacity for an invasive species. Um, what the ecosystem looks like if the invader was to meet carrying capacity would be a completely different ecosystem because it's taken over and changed the dynamics of that. So it's not the normal carrying capacity um, anymore. What, that, what will happen though is the lionfish will eventually um, overtake enough of the area that the fact some factors will come in like usually predator and prey dynamics. So if the predator runs out of prey, the predator population starts to go down and gives the uh, prey a chance to rebound. That's where we have equilibrium. The problem is that if lionfish get to this point where they've done that, we've decimated most of the native fish at that point. So um, right now, lionfish are still in this exponential growth phase, even from the time that I've been research researching them since 2009. Um, we've kept them here. Why? Because we've been able to create uh, teams of, of, of divers to go out and control the population. So we have not yet seen the invasion peak. They, we won't ever, once they're established here, it will never go back the other way. This is only a one-way direction. So we need to keep constant pressure here to keep the lionfish at this level so that they are not um, able to reach that peak. This means we need constant continual removal efforts. Removal efforts at that level. Okay, so what makes the lionfish the perfect invader? What life history traits about it? Um, Superman's one of my favorite superheroes, so I try to throw him in wherever I can. Um, if you think about Superman, though, even though he lives on planet Earth, he's an alien from Krypton. So he came from 
an, uh, another planet. He is a non-native on planet Earth. And he the reason why he has his superpowers is because the Earth's gravity, gravity and the sun doesn't work on him like it does everybody else. If he goes to Krypton, he's like a regular person. Um, he, he doesn't have the superpowers, but it's the fa- it's the um, the heat and the rays from the, our sun and the gravity of planet Earth that because of his dense molecular bone structure that gives him the, all the powers that he has. So that's the same idea with an invader like lionfish when they go from a non-native place to a new ecosystem. They have never had to deal with the evolution that all those other species have had to adapt to in that new area. So they're almost like the superheroes or in this case, super villains of that area because they have an advantage over all the other species that are there that have been controlled by evolution and adaptations working together. Um, so remember, first of all, they are scorpion fish, uh, which means that they are venomous. I'm going to take out my Lenny the lionfish here. So lionfish are kind of frilly like this, and they have um, venomous spines and fin rays on their dorsal side. They have a caudal tail here. Um, Then they have two anal fins that have a venomous spine and fin rays. Um, So the arrangement of the spines, there's 13 dorsal spines followed by um, some fin rays that do not have any venom spines. Um, Then there are three on the anal fin and two on the pelvic fin. So again, there's 13 on top, three on the anal fin, and two on the pelvic fins. So you really want to avoid all the top and bottom of the lionfish without getting stung. The the caudal tail has no spines, and the rear of the dorsal has no spines. The pectoral has no spines, but I don't want to deal with any of them. Okay, when I'm dealing with lionfish, and I'll talk about this with handling them, I just avoid all of that, okay? But just be aware of, of, of where they are. Um, so the, the soft dorsal rays are not venomous. Um, so if they, they, they really don't harm you at all. Um, the reason why the venom uh, is extracted from the, the spine is because they, this, each spine is surrounded by a sheath of skin. And there really aren't venom glands in the skin. There, it's more like glandular cells that release the toxin. This sheath of skin, when it, when it goes to pierce you, actually gets pulled back and it squeezes the glandular cells and the, and the spine is like a sharp syringe needle and that, and that it injects the venom through a groove that where the, the toxin follows down into your wound. Um, so, um, a lot of non-native predators exhibit avoidance for lionfish. They're able to detect that these things are venomous. Um, so they are smart enough to stay away. This has given them an advantage in their native habitat for protection. And it's giving them even greater advantage here. Nothing wants to mess with them because they are venomous. They have a rapid growth and abundance. Um, Species do not generally grow in population in their native ranges the way lionfish do. Um, So they they have no checks and balance on how they can grow. They grow in much higher densities and they grow to larger sizes here in their non-native range than they do in their native ranges. Um, Why did this happen? Because let's think about this. If these lionfish came from originally a founding genetic stock of aquarium release species, that means that those fish that were in the aquarium had to survive being taken from their native environment, captured, brought on a plane, stayed in an aquarium and an aquarium store fish tank for a while, and then went to somebody else's fish tank for a while, and then made their way to the ocean. So these are genetically hardy species. They are strong. And they're already good at surviving because they've already been through that test. Um, so now these genes are the founding genes for all of the offspring that are, that are now invasive, the gremlins. They, um, they do have some, uh, they have parasitic release. The parasites do not control their growth like they would for other fish 
that are native here. If you ever cut open a, a fish and really examine it, they're riddled with parasites. Um, the, the lionfish exhibit what's called parasitic release. They, they may have a few, but it's not the right life stage um, for them to be at the fish to really do any harm to it. Um, they live longer than 15 years, reaching sizes of greater than 20 inches. Uh, the average size of a non-native lionfish uh, was, uh, is about 7.4 inches, um, but ranges uh, in size can be from uh, 1 to 15.3 inches. So we're talking over a foot. I, I know some have been recorded in some derbies as, uh, I think, 22 inches. Um, so pretty, pretty large. Um, all right, so where do they live? Habitat preference and behavior. Lionfish inhabit all marine habitat types and depths from the shoreline to over a thousand feet deep. They could be really shallow. They could be under dock pilings or in canals, or they could be down at the bottom depths where nobody's going to reach them because they're at a thousand feet of water. Um, they like also artificial structures like canals but they also, uh, uh, and shipwrecks, but they also can be found in estuaries, mangroves, and shallow deep reefs. Um, in these areas, lionfish can reach densities over 200 adults per acre. Um, and that's not that you just go out there and just see like a swarm of lionfish, but they have been able to survive that closely packed together, which is not something that you normally see in their native habitats. Um, I was in Hawaii a few months ago and they have what's the green lionfish, which I thought was really cool. I'm like, hey, I've never seen a green lionfish. I've seen lots of other ones, the red lionfish. And there was one and it was tiny and it was and it was super camouflaged and it blended right in with its environment. Um, the, di the dive instructor found it, but I only saw the one the whole time I, I was diving in Hawaii. Whereas opposed to here, I mean, you see lionfish all the time They're, they, and they live in groups close together. Um, lionfish exhibit what's called high sight fidelity. They don't move around very much. When I was um, uh, a master's student, I was trying to help study um, the, the lionfish movement and looking at uh, do they travel along the reefs as, um, as continuous reefs would enable them a habitat to just move wherever they want, or are they more isolated in patch reef areas? Um, and really the studies have shown that um, that in patch reefs, they stick around very well, but in continuous reefs, there's more movement. Um, in my study, uh, I'm not entirely sure if it was because we were tagging them and sort of messing with them that it caused them to, to leave, but it was rare that we did find um, uh, the same tag lionfish at the same site after we went to it. Um, but, for the, but they do like localized areas. Um, when I dive on Turtle Ledge or um, lighthouse uh, reef, I will always see lionfish in the same spots. So maybe they are attracted to just certain types of crevices. That's uh, something else to consider. Um, they are commonly observed along reef ledges and outcroppings, hovering near motionless with their head tilted slightly down. So if I use Lenny the lionfish here again, most of the time they're almost motionless, like they're just hovering. And they always have their head tilted down a little bit with their caudal tails up at this angle because they're scanning. They're, they're doing this to blend in with their surroundings, but they're also um, active predators. They're not sit and wait predators. They are actually hunting all the time. And so this is their sort of hunting movement and they're positioning themselves to snatch up a prey, which I'll show you in a video in a moment of, of what that looks like. Um, they have a thermal tolerance range of about 56 degrees Fahrenheit to 81 degrees Fahrenheit. So lionfish have been found as far north as New York and Massachusetts, but those waters get way too cold in the winter and they die. So that's another example of, of how climate can limit introductions of species. So that's why South Florida is just such a great spot for them because it's right in their range. Yeah, yeah go ahead. So in those kind of far extents, are they migrating up there and then coming back or they're just kind of haphazardly going up there and then dying? Correct. Right? Second one. Yeah, okay. exactly. They'll just, they won't come back. They just go up there, get lost and they die. Same thing happens with a lot of our other, of our other tropicals like damselfish, butterfly fish can be seen up there. Um, surgeon fish can actually do pretty well. Um, uh, Sergeant majors, but when the water drops really cold like that, um, they usually die. Our sea turtles um, also have a big problem with that because especially the juveniles, um, they are just following the Gulf Stream and they're too young to have learned yet when it's time to turn around. 
So they stay up there through the winter and they get cold shocked and stunned. And so there's actually rescuers on Long Island that will go out and rescue the stranded sea turtles because they're ectotherms. They can't survive in the cold. And they they ship them. They fly them back down to um, uh, yeah. Florida. And then they, they put them in thera uh, 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 therapy to get them back to health. Uh, go ahead. What's your question? Oh, I was looking at the uh, temperature tolerance. Yes. It gets a lot warmer than that in a lot of the areas they are. Yes. So they can live, but just not as well. Yeah. Or, okay. They see so a lot of fish. It's like it's hot out there. I mean, cor even corals and other fish will stress out when temperatures get that high because you're depleting the oxygen. Um, and they, it, even though, I mean, this is average, right? Okay. So it's usually during an El Nino year when we get those waters that are really, really like almost 90 degrees. And, um, and that's and all the animals are stressing at that time. Good question. All right, so I have to go, I don't think this is gonna play. So I have to go out of this into my other file here. So um, lion, like I said, lionfish can live to over a thousand feet deep. So uh, this is a video that I'll, I'll play that shows just uh, some of the deep areas we observe them here in South Florida. So end show. All right, I'm gonna hit that, yeah. And then I wanna go to here. Can I remove this? Yeah. But wait. <laughs> So this is the Antipodes. It's a small little yellow submarine. Um, it was um, donated for usage at Nova Southeastern for about a week. And all different scientists went out on it um, uh, to observe lionfish in the depths. It can only go about six, I think, knots. So it has to be transported with another towboat to its destination, and then it can be deployed. Um, we have to use little zodiacs to actually get into the hatch. first times that we've been able to see lionfish at the depths that we were up in. I did, I got that, yeah. It basically, yeah. Um, it was definitely awesome to do. This can hold about five people, two on each side. And then a captain. But here you can see the lionfish. too much work to get to, to get food look how fat they are you can tell i mean they've been just gorging themselves they're not scared of having a giant sub on top of them no. <laughs> This is a uh, trap that uh, we used to collect our lionfish in. It has right. basically, uh, it's called it's called the Prapper. It's made by Bob Hickerson, and it's a lobster condo with the flap in here still. It's been modified so that it's they got more of a uh, circumference uh, covered, and then the outside they've taken the mesh part of the lobster trap off and put a dry bag around it with a nice handy zipper, so you don't have to reach around and grab all those spines. You just dump the lionfish right out. So that makes it nice and handy.
I hardly help you out with some of this here in ICM. Um, so let me go back to PowerPoint. So as you can see, lionfish can be found on shallow reefs under natural crevices, or in that example where they were at, uh, I think that was probably like 400 feet. I, the one I went to was about 330. Um, they look for any artificial structure when it's that deep. They, they, there's, they were around nothing else but where that one artificial structure was. So they like to use that. They use that to their advantage um, to camouflage them when they're hunting. And uh, they were not afraid of anything else that was around them. And they were fat, happy lionfish down at uh, a couple hundred feet of water. Um, There we go. So lionfish have high reproductive rates. Lionfish become sexually mature in less than a year and spawn in pairs. Um, they usually do a little bit of a courtship uh, with each other. A single female lionfish can spawn over 2 million eggs per year. Uh, after courtship, reproduction occurs throughout the year about every 30 days. So that means like once a month, a female is able to release these egg masses. Um, the egg masses are bound in gelatinous uh, material that are dispersed via ocean surface currents and uh, they hatch four days as competent swimmers able to capture other zooplankton so from the moment that they are basically born they are carnivores and they're eating other zooplankton uh, creatures uh, it, though these are when lionfish are in their larval stage so the currents are able to transport them very far distances it, their larval duration is about 26 days so they can be transported from uh, the Caribbean to the Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic Ocean, no problem. It's just all of those waters are connected by current activity. Um, so they're wreak wreaking havoc in the larval stage of their, of, their, of their lives, which also affects the community of all the other fish that also have larvae in the planktonic stage during their uh, early development. This is uh, the gelatinous egg mass. Um, it's usually broken down by bacteria that releases all the eggs and it floats because it's gelatinous. So that helps you go with the currents. And I found this guy off of um, the nursery in Pompano. My friend uh, Amanda and I uh, found it. And you can see this is this guy is just a, a little recruit uh, that's settled on the reef. It's not even really uh, two centimeters yet. Um, what's that? How'd you catch it? So we we. We kind of corralled it with our, our hands, and then I had happened to have a Ziploc bag, and we got it into the Ziploc bag. It took two of us. We, I mean, we didn't have any else, so we didn't want to touch it either. But um, she had great eyes, and she's the one that spotted. I have to give her credit for it. Um, but this is so. So you can see they look a lot different when when their uh, post settlement larvae uh, becomes a new recruit, and then they'll develop into a more mature lionfish. Now, um, also with the venomations and the stings, when they're younger. The venom is usually more potent as well. Um, okay, so lionfish habitat and hunting. So lionfish are relatively inactive during the day and can be found lurking among the reef crevices for shelter. Um, they like to be hiding in things all the time. They won't be just out in the open during the daytime. Um, although they retreat into shelter during the day, they are not nocturnal predators. We actually call them crepuscular. They're more, most active in the early morning and the late afternoon. Um, the juveniles live in small groups, but adults typically live alone. Um, when hunting, their pectorals are spread wide and maneuver, maneuver prey into a position that can be swallowed whole with a rapid snap of their jaws. So when they're hunting in that head down inverted position, they're using their uh, pectoral fins spread out to kind of herd their prey into an area along the crevices where it, it, they block it and trap it. And then they just, they have like vacuum mouths that rapidly suck them up. Um, I think my next video here, my, oh, it's not yet, it's coming. I have a video for that. Um, they are voracious carnivores. Um, so they have a very unique predation strategy that is actually not seen here in the Caribbean Atlantic by anything else. They are cryptic, which means that they blend in very well with their environment, but they stalk and herd their prey during these crepuscular hours. It makes it a lot different than our other sit-and-wait predators, stingrays, sto uh, uh, scorpion fish, 
um, even an octopus, well, they, they hunt a little bit, but, um, but they, they're more like, let's, I'm going to sit here and wait for my food to come to me. I'm going to lure, maybe they'll have a little lure. Um, but lionfish, they just camouflage themselves. They are almost motionless and they stalk their prey. Um, so nothing else does that here. All the prey don't know to avoid this behavior because they're, again, evolution hasn't set that into their instinct. Um, they are generalist carnivores that consume over 56 species of fish and many invertebrate species as well. When they're younger, they tend to eat more invertebrates. As they get older, they switch to more of a fish diet. Um, prey are commercially, recreationally, or ecologically important, like herbivores or food web stability of the trophic level biomass. So if they're eating all the herbivores, that's bad because we don't want algae on our reef. Some algae is good for the reef, but if we have a problem with pollution like we do here in South Florida, all those algal blooms take over the, the substrate of the reef and prevent coral growth. Um, and it also changes the whole um, uh, trophic levels uh, dynamics that, that are, is responsible for expanding that energy through the food web. So they can cause what's called um, a trophic cascade and affect the entire food web this way. Um, they consume prey up to two thirds of the lionfish's body size. I have seen uh, lionfish with their mouth agape and they can't close it because there's a fish still stuck in its mouth. Um, and this is a, a fish that was dissected. This came from reef and you can see all of these were found in its stomach contents. They haven't even been fully digested yet. I used to do lots of dissections with them and always, I mean, you noticeable how many fish that you can identify um, inside their guts. Um, but lots of herbivores and juveniles, even um, juvenile Nassau grouper, which are endangered. Do they do any crustaceans? Yes, they, yeah, they do crustaceans, yep. Okay. Little shrimps. Um, here we go. So lionfish saw and corral their play. I have to switch back out of this because it doesn't want to play in this format. What about cephalopods? That's a great question. I have not seen that, but they don't have much bone or they, um, they really only have their beaks. So that would, that's all that would be left after digestion, really. Um, so I think that's hard to detect. But maybe that's, that's a great thing to look into. Open with. Okay, so now how do I find it? How do I trade it? And I'm going to turn the sound off on this one. Okay, so um, I was catching lionfish alive and putting them in tanks just to observe their behavior and see how they were feeding. Um, and so I'm feeding them ghost shrimp here. There's a little ghost shrimp. Um, and so you see, there he goes, head down right away, pectoral fin spread wide, moves very, very slowly. And the snap is gone. This he sees another one. Yep, see that? See how rapid that is? Their mouth actually protrudes forward and creates a suction. Um, there's that head down inverted posture. So these guys are active hunters. Um, and this is a tank that I had at um, the Nova Oceanographic Center facility. So invasion impacts, they create competition for food and space among native species. They are definitely competing with our groupers, which are uh, basically top predators on the reef. Um, so I've even seen groupers in uh, deep uh, depths eat a shark. So um, groupers are big carnivores. They can compete with sharks. Um, but lionfish are doing a pretty good job competing with the native groupers uh, because they they prey on the same species that um, groupers would. Um, they also do a good job. They, they have been reported eating lobsters. So you asked about crustacean. They do eat lobsters. Um, but they're also not just worried about competing with all these other species for food and taking away the food. 
but they take up space. If there's a bunch of lion fishing here, this is the same habitat that grouper like to rest and shelter in as well. So we're kicking out and displacing our native predators. This is again, destabilizing the whole community. Um, so we are, what we have seen, and luckily control efforts have put a stop measure to this, but um, where lionfish were not in control, and especially at the early stage of the invasion, um, we've had a biodiversity reduction in the native species on reefs. Um, there were fewer large predatory reef game fish for human consumption, and we lost our top-down predator control. Um, this triggers cascading impacts through the disruptions of the food web. So we go from a nice, healthy, complex food web ecosystem here to adding the lionfish in there, and now we've got a disturbance in our ecosystem. Okay, so invasion impacts reduced herbivory. Like I said, we want our herbivores on the reef. Consumption of herb herbivorous fish causes increase in reef algal growth. And this, this disrupts top-down macroalgae control. It's the macroalgae that overtakes the reef habitat. It, can, um, it grows much faster than coral does. So it, it, it doesn't the, give a chance for the, the coral larvae to settle where there is algae. Um, so we need our herbivores on the reefs to prevent, basically they're the lawnmowers of the reef. So a lot of people used to say to me at the beginning of studying all of this and the invasion, well, why do you have to kill them? Why, you know what, they're here, nature said its way, which nature didn't do it, it was human um, impacted, but what would be the worst thing? We just let them stay here and let nature take its course. Nature always finds a way, right? Jurassic Park. Um, well, Albans and Hickson, who've done a lot of work on lionfish extensively, um, they came up with a worst case scenario. Um, continued lionfish spread throughout the Greater Caribbean would only be controlled if we just let them do, do it on their own. First, starvation, which means that they've eaten all of the prey. There's no more native species. Um, then we also would see biotic resistance of the native species. So eventually there could be, where we talk about equilibrium at the end of that invasion stage, some native species might start to learn to become competitors. So, um, some predators might possibly start to prey upon lionfish. And then parasites or pathogens could find their way to take over lionfish. We haven't seen any of this yet, years later. So lionfish are established. They're here to stay. But there is good news. Save a reef, eat a lionfish. They are tasty. They are delicious. Anybody ever had lionfish? Awesome. Yeah. Sweet, flaky fish, um, ceviche, fried, grilled, however you want to do it. Um, luckily, they're tasty and you can eat them. The hard part in the beginning was convincing people that because they're venomous that you can eat them. But it's only the venom's only in their spines. This white... Um, flaky meat tissue does not have the venom, and it is a delicious fish. And because they grow so large here, you, um, they can become commercially uh, valuable, which is what we're trying to do um, for the, to control the invasion. This is Chef Andrew Gordon. He was down in the Keys when I was an intern down there, and they did, um, uh, we did a derby, and he took all the lionfish and cooked a whole bunch of food with them, and it was great. I still like the ceviche the best. Um, so eradication is not possible now that lionfish are established. That is something that we've learned. Okay, are, there's no way are we ever going to have a reef free of lionfish. Um, from the Florida Fish and Wildlife um, uh, Commission, though, they've got they've done a really good job of getting involved in action and managing the issue. Um, they revoked from the beginning. They revoked the requirement to have a saltwater fishing license to remove lionfish. So you don't. If, if some people don't want to be uh, fishers, they don't like spear fishing. They don't like hook and line fishing, but they want to protect the reef. They will hunt lionfish just to remove the lionfish, and this way they don't even need a license to do it. Um, there's no bag or size limits on lionfish like there are for native fish. Um, prohib. This is really important. They prohibit the importation of live lionfish. And they're able to do this under, I think, the Lacey Act, which is a federal law. Um, but basically the idea is that we already have so many 
lionfish that we're trying to get rid of in the ocean, we don't want them being grown in captivity and transported around. If you can sell lionfish, but they have to be ca caught from the ocean and sold from the ocean, not for, uh, through the, uh, the aquarium trades that allow them to import lionfish. Um, and there's uh, uh, also, uh, FWC has been uh, sponsoring an increased opportunity that will allow participants in approved tournaments and other organized events to spear lionfish and other invasive species in areas where spear fishing is not allowed. That's super important. Um, marine protected areas. Um, a lot of places still have regulations that don't allow people to even take a spear into those waters. So we've had to sort of remove those control measures to allow people to remove the lionfish in there. Um, so like some of the MPAs down in the Tees, mm -hmm. like Alligator Reef, for instance, and you know, Chica Rocks and all that, you can't spear anything normally, but you can spear lionfish. Yeah, they you can they actually were for a while. It's been a minute since I've did that they're doing all that, but we used to have a lionfish flag. Yeah. That's that we would fly that would show that we are here spear fishing for lionfish only cool. and you can take the short poles like I, I like the, one of these here. Yeah. Okay. So um so this I mean this usually is a good giveaway that you're only going after lionfish with this. Um and they, they have special permits that you can get as well. Um but uh yes, they have allowed lionfish removal um throughout the keys. All the all of the leaves are popping out along the reef line there. Can people fish those areas normally? Like, you know, yeah, real fish and spear fish. Yes, there are no restrictions or regulations here in Papua, which I think is unfortunate. They tried years ago to create a marine protected area there and, and regulate the fishing, and everybody came out and was like, no, against it. I will say, though, up at the Blue Heron Bridge, you can collect them, but you can't bring in a spear. You have to collect them with those the, uh, nets. the net bags. Yeah. I'll show you how to do that. I have that. Um, yeah, so like places like that, though, they still regulate. You have to check the location. Because uh, Blue Heron Bridge is now a marine protected area, correct? Yeah. Uh, it's a no take zone. It's no take zone, okay. Well, no take on scuba because they right. have the fishing gear. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so what are we relying on for this? Local human control. This is shown to be the greatest measure in uh, controlling the lionfish invasion. Uh, but there are limitations uh, that we have to stay within safe dive depths and maintain a proper bottom time. It's not worth it to go into deco for your lionfish. And like I showed you, we are limited to um, recreational divers, max depth, 140 feet. And if you're a tech diver, you may go down deeper. I actually have pictures of, I gave some tech divers some lionfish bags and, and they did spear, but honestly, um, they have such a long deco time on the way up. They're stuck holding these lionfish, so they don't want to take them down there with all their bottles. So lionfish are, can be even beyond that in the, over a thousand feet. Maybe some rebreathers will go down there, but um, uh, at a thousand feet, really, they have free range of territory. Um, so that's a big limitation how we control them. We're really only able to target them in certain areas. Um, visual detection may underestimate population size because due to cryptic and crepuscular behavior. So because they blend in so well, and because they're only most active during the daytime, early morning, I'm sorry, early morning and late evening, it makes it really, really hard for us to be there when the lionfish are there. Um, how many lionfish should be removed to decrease the population? Well, in a study done by Morris, um, James Morris, um, in his model, 27% of the adult lionfish population needs to be removed per month in order to just maintain um, a normal balance. Um, Barber said in her model, came up with 65% per year. Um, so that is a big effort of, of how many lionfish you have to remove. And again, we may not even know their full population in the area because they hide in so many crevices so well. Um, all right, so lionfish hunting. First, have a lionfish prepare kit if you are hunting. Here are some essentials for lionfish hunting. You want to have protective puncture proof gloves, especially, and that's for a certain situation when you're handling them. These gloves right here are um, cut proof, but they are not puncture proof. So their spines will go through this. Um, and I, I will show you and I'll talk about how you can just avoid that altogether. But if you're going to be handling them, you really only want to use the Kevlar um, pu uh, puncture proof gloves uh, Hexar, I'm sorry, Hexar puncture proof gloves, um, which are hard to find. Um, you want to have a pole spear 
So there's a lot of different sizes of pole spears, right? Some people do like to hunt, um, hunt lionfish with a spear like this because they feel like they can get um, further into some of the deeper crevices. Um, but my, my pole spear is only about this size, and I find this to be most appropriate um, because it allows me to just get right up in where I want to be to get my shot on the lionfish. You don't need a whole lot of area to, uh, to hunt them. They, they, you really want to be close to them before you strike. Um, the other part is that you want to have on your pole spear a trident tip. So the trident tip, you can buy them separate and just attach them if it's just a single point spear. Um, but th let me open up this one here. The trident tip acts like a paralyzer so that, see that it's got three prongs on it and it got little barbs at the end here. So that when you go to, let's see if he sits there. He's gonna sit. Um, when you catch your lionfish, okay, it basically paralyzes it and it can't spin around on the spear. It's, it's punctured this way with the three prongs and it can't move. Um, the single point tips allow it to flick off. It'll, it, they can um, bend really fast and they're powerful and they'll just flick right off that spear. Um, so you, that's, you really want to have these trident spears to make sure they can't escape once you get them on there. Um, then you want to have a containment device. No, I'm going to because I'm going to come back to that. Um, so it could be a thick me, um, plastic bag, like a dry bag, which is what we used to use when I was netting them, or a zookeeper, which has become very common and popular. It's a PVC tube, pl plexiglass, um, and this protects you completely from their spines. And it's really easy so that when you get your um, your lionfish, which one I guess on this one, you just put it right in the tube right there, and then it pulls right off. And you don't have to deal with them at all. And this way, you're not ever touching them. You should have gloves, but you don't have to worry about the gloves because you're not actually touching the lionfish. It's going right in there with the spines. You pull it off, and it's in its containment device. Um, so th this is really handy. And you can just you can clip it onto you or hold it. It's got a handle. Um, so you want to have a, a containment co uh, collector. Or a thick plastic dry bag will work as well. Um, you want to have a flashlight. Because remember, lionfish are going to be underneath the crevices. And they sometimes they can be upside down, too, under there. So they blend in very well. They're cryptic. So that flashlight is going to bring their color back. And it'll help you see under those crevices. Um, you want to have dive cutting shears. I'll talk about this later. But um, this is what you want to use to help remove the spines. Um, also, if you're doing a reef cleanup, this is also very handy to come in to get the monofilament line. Um, then you also want to have a gallon of hot, fresh water kept on board the boat. And I'll tell you why in a moment, but that is the treatment that we use if you do get stuck. Um, and then you need a bucket with ice for the fish caught on the boat. Um, this will euthanize the fish um, very uh, humanely, and it keeps the fish fresh, especially if you want it for meat. Um, does yes. Any, does anybody just use some kind of method to strip the fish off the pole and leave it for scavengers? Um, so yeah, I'll talk about that, but people do. And yeah, I'll talk about that. I'll come back to that. Um, control methods. Um, so protect your hands from the envenomation with the puncture proof gloves. These have, um, this hex armor, they have a pad in here, not in the palm side, but on the back side that protects from the, uh, spines. Um, so that's if your so if your, your hand is near it this way, it's protection there. Um, and it's pretty stronger, but they can still puncture through. But these are what we're using for a long time when we're holding the lionfish um, and catching them. And then you can see they're using shears to remove those venomous spines. Um, so you want to protect your hands and remove the spines. Um, lionfish generally avoid human divers. Um, if, they, if you approach them too fast, they will retreat. Um, worldwide, scorpion fish is ranked second only to stingrays in the total number of envenomation, with an estimated occurrence of approximately 40,000 to 50,000 cases annually. I think it's stung by stingrays. Yeah, by stingrays, not lionfish. So really, yeah. stingrays tend to be yeah. still the more dominant 
Um, and when we think about how lionfish have spread everywhere, stingrays still are responsible for it in the number one. Um, but lionfish stings can be severe. The severity of the sting reactions um, in humans is dependent upon a number of factors. The location of the sting, um, the amount of venom delivered, and the strength of the immune system of the victim. It's different for everybody. Um, localized envenomation symptoms include persistent, intense throbbing, radiating sharp pain at the site of the envenomation. It is the worst pain of your life. And I know that women have uh, childbirth. This is not, if not that 10 times, it's like somebody just put your hand in a vice and smashed it. Um, it is a throbbing pain. Um, then afterwards, you might get a tingling sensation. It could get hot and sweaty or uh, and blister as well. Um, worst case examples of the envenomation may cause headache, nausea. I had a friend. I'll talk about that. Headache, nausea, vomiting happened. Um, abdominal pain, delirium, seizures, paralysis of limbs, a rise or drop in blood pressure, respiratory distress, heart complications, including congestive heart failure, um, pulmonary edema, tremors, muscle weakness, and loss of consciousness. Um, also, a secondary infection could occur from the bacteria. Um, this is all variable because everybody's body is different. There is no set science of what's going to happen from the sting. It depends on your tolerance to the sting. Um, this is my hand when I was stung. And I can tell you, I didn't have the, uh, the nausea. I didn't throw up. Um, but you can see how red, I only got stung right there on my pinky. And my pinky was, you can see how fat all of my hand got from it. And my entire hand hurt. I couldn't move my hand. It was completely locked up. We were, the only thing we were worried about was um, because the tips of my fingers were turning white that I was going to get blood loss because the pressure and throbbing was building so much. And it just hurt like my hand was con uncontrollably under pressure. Like if that's the only, it's the weird, it doesn't feel like a sting. It's a throbbing pressure. Um, I'm glad I only experienced that once. Um, here is what they're doing. They're, they're soaking it in hot water. Okay. And the reason why hot water works is because it's the heat that denatures the venom protein complex. Every venom has a different way that that protein gets denatured or broken down. You can't pee on it. You can't use vinegar. That's for like jellyfish venom stings. But stingrays and uh, 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 lionfish can both be treated with hot water because you want to break the shape of the protein. That's how it's active and working on your cells and your tissue. By changing the shape of the protein, it inactivates the venom. Um, so basic treatment for lionfish envenomation includes immersing the afflicted area in hot water about, um, uh, at a, about 100 degrees um, Celsius, um, which is boiling, right? So you want to test that before with your good hand before you put your hand in there because it's very important yeah. that you don't burn the, your skin. Your hand is hurting so much, you will, you will not notice the temperature of the water. So you want to test it with your good hand first. If it's too hot, cool it down, throw some cool water in there as well, but keep it in there for 15 to 20 minutes to help inactivate the venom. It will still swell and hurt for a while afterwards. Um, where hot water is not available, other products such as hot hands, which are heating pads, can be used to heat up the water. Um, and then it's recommended to seek secondary medical treatment because like I said, you could get a secondary infection or it could have caused muscle tissue or damage. Um, all right, so lionfish hunting tips. Be conscious of the environment and protect the reef while hunting, first and foremost. The whole reason why we're hunting lionfish is because we want to protect our reefs. So if you're in uh, the, on the reef and you're trampling all over it and your hand's on the reef and you're breaking the coral to get a lionfish, you're just um, uh, being a negative influence instead of a positive influence, okay? It defeats the purpose. So... Be conscious of your environment, protect the reef while you're hunting. Um, move slow, breathe slow, and maintain good buoyancy control. Um, this is So these two skills right here are just basic good diving skills that you can use to become a good hunter. This will help your bottom time and hunting skills to catch more. If you are slow and you have good control, you are less noticeable to the lionfish. I guarantee you, you cannot outswim a fish. I have tried it. And... <laughs> 
if they catch on to you that you're trying to catch them, they are gone. So you want to maintain good buoyancy to hover like they hover. You got to kind of be the predator yourself. And then you want to just very, very slowly creep up on them and have good lung control to do that. Also, having good lung control means that you're conserving your air and you can spend more time down there. It's very easy to get caught up in your hunting and trying to catch that lionfish. And then you look down at your air and you've got like 200 pounds when you thought you had a thousand. Okay, so you want to be aware of your pressure and your breathing while you're doing this. Um, think like a hammerhead. You know, when hammerhead sharks swim, they swim from side to side. They have all that sensory in their heads, okay? They swivel swim like this. So be a swivel swimmer. You want to scan across the entire reef. Don't get focused in one area. You want to be able to go up the reef and down the reef, zigzag around it, um, so that you uh, create a broader path of where you're it's, uh, looking for your lionfish. Look under crevices, but do not stick your head or hand inside because what else could be in there? A moray eel, maybe a nurse shark, something else, okay? Or maybe you put your hand on the lionfish. So you don't want to necessarily go inside and reach in. That's why your flashlight would come in hand. Um, uh, under the crevices, sometimes this is the only place to find them. So again, carry a flashlight and use your inverted body posture then. If you're good and your buoyancy, you can... You can die with your head down and your feet up, and then you can shoot them that way or at least find them and reposition yourself. Um, lionfish are crepuscular, so hunt at dawn or dusk when they are most active. Um, most people don't dive at those times, so you're going to be looking under those crevices. Um, visit artificial reefs because in most cases that is the only habitat structure in the area for them to go to. So they will, they will target those artificial sites because a lot of these, everything else around it is just sand usually. Um, train your eyes for lionfish patterns. Yes, you can train your eyes to be a lionfish hunter. Um, remember, lionfish have these white tips and uh, with their fins and spines that are spread out. I kind of think um, like feather dusters. I think for like feather dusters on the reef. And so I look for, the, I look for that broken up variation of those white kind of flowery, um, fins. Um, the parts of the lionfish that were intended to be a defense or help the corral the prey to be a predator of the lionfish, give them away to us as well. So use that against them. Um, and where there is one lionfish, there are probably more in that same area. There are many times where I've shot a lionfish and then I, I looked and said, oh, this one was sitting right next to me the whole time. I didn't even notice it. Um, all right. So there are two methods to be a lionfish hunter. In both met methods, always approach slow and in control of your buoyancy. Again, you don't want to give yourself away. Um, now, back before we were really spearing, when we first started removing the lionfish, we were collecting them with nets. And I don't even have them anymore, but we were using hand nets. Where, and I have pictures to show you, but we would kind of position the nets around the, li the lionfish and scoop them up as one, like that. It took a long time to do that. And you have eventually would get beat the learning curve and get good at it. Um, but it was, just, it was just not really efficient. Um, you could use a PVC pole as sort of like a positioner to kind of motion, nudge them over to where you want them to scoop them up. Um, but a lot of times they would just get tired of and dart off. Um, we would contain the lionfish in the nets, like on the sand and then bring over, or you could keep them together like this and bring it over, but you want to bring over your dive bag or your, your plastic bag. And then um, uh, you, you need your buddy for this. So this takes two people because you can't hold two nets and the plastic bag. Um, so then you would take out your protective gloves at, um, so uh, from the lionfish, and you'd always uh, position it by holding it from the head, okay? And then you would then place it into the bag. This is how people got stuck. This is why we wanted to wear the gloves, okay? Um, so here's some pictures of that. So you can see there's the lionfish, and I'm taking my, uh, my two net bags, bringing them together, and then scoop them up really quick. And then you, we, I would carry around like 10 lionfish, and I always felt uncomfortable mm -hmm. just carrying in a plastic bag. Once, sometimes their spines would stick out, but usually when the spines hit the plastic bag, it kind of folded them in, so they never actually punctured through. Um, but you can see, like, this is how we did it for a long time. And this was what was done in a lot of the marine protected areas before they started to allow people to spear in there. But like I said, it's very inefficient. Um, 
So the second way is spearing. And this quickly became the more efficient way to do it. We saw how quick you could do it. And the benefit is that it requires only one diver to actually go after the fish, but you still want to maintain good buddy contact with your diver, um, with your other buddy. Use pole spears with a trident or paralyzer tip. Like I already went over that, but it's this paralyzer tip here that allows the fish to be stuck without being able to flick off and spin around on you. Um, with the pole spears, um, they basically have this band. And, well, I don't want to, this is tied up, I don't want to do it, but you pull the band on it and you pull it back and then you let go of the band and it shoots forward. Okay, and you still maintain position of the spear. And that's why um, you don't have to, you don't want to be far away from the lionfish. You want to be within contact. Um, aim for right behind the gill covers or their pickle. Now, where you, where, it, go for where you think you're going to get the lionfish. But the best spot to, Make sure that lionfish is going to uh, not get off that spear and, and have a good kill shot is right behind that pectoral fin. It's the fattest, fleshiest part of it. And all those prongs can get in there right away. And usually if I get that fish right there, I've got it the first time right away. It's not going to get off. So that's really the best spot. So, I mean, I've, I've gotten them here on the tail, but then they can still even flick off because this is so thin here. They can just move their tail. They have more of their power up here. So this really just, it, um, uh, uh, restricts them if you get them right behind here, and it's easiest to put them into the zookeeper that way. Um, keep this, uh, keep them on the spear, and then use dive shears to remove spines or place directly into the containment collector with the spear. This kind of leads to what you were saying. Um, so some people take the lionfish and hold it down with the spear, like in the sand, and keep it immobilized, and then underwater, they cut off all the spines because they don't want to deal with it at all. They want to take care of it there. Um, or they just put it right into the zookeeper, and then they'll deal with the spines later. But you still want to use the shears. Now, you'd ask me, like, do some people just let them go? If you cut off their spines, they will grow. They, they were still alive. They'll still be a voracious predator. Um, if you uh, don't cut the spines, just let them go, and you think they have a good wound on them, they will heal. Fish are really, really good at healing and recovering. Um, they have a really, you know, their immune system, these things are, are even though they're fish, um, they can tolerate a lot of diseases and pain, and, and they will grow. I've seen uh, lionfish with scars um, survive, and they learn. If you let them go, they learn very, very fast of what it means to be hunted. And they are harder to catch the second time. I mean, even with um, if you miss the first time, they've already learned what you're doing, and it's hard to catch them again. Um, I have left lionfish underwater, but I take them, um, I, I hold them down with my spear, and I take out my dive knife, and I uh, put it through both their eyes to break the brain stem, and then they're and they just float up dead completely. So if I didn't have a containment device, and I and I caught a lionfish, um, and I didn't want to bring it up. I'm not recommending. That's what everybody does, but that's that's what I have done in the past. I've never just let the lionfish go. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a question on the online. Um, is it better to cut their spines off underwater or wait till you get back on the boat? I'm going to address that in a second. It's okay. a really good question. Um, so here's spearing. Um, so you can see they're very effective and the zookeeper you can still get a, a whole lot of them using the, the short pole spear um see my spear is a little bit longer um and i've got the lionfish uh, and a paralyzer tip so i can swim with it and it's not going anywhere um and then usually like i hold it down onto like the not the reef but like the sand area and i can that's where i'll cut the spines off underwater there um, here's some more with the zookeeper and spearing. So it's really easy to administer the putting the fish into the zookeeper. Um, so here you can see the again, also the, the, the spear is towards the head right behind their per, uh, perculum there again as well. That's the best spot to, uh, to uh, spear them. Um, what not to do. Um, there are a few known predators of lionfish. Studies have observed coronet fish in the native ocean ranges eating lionfish. Um, we don't have cor we have so um, 
uh, we don't have coronet fish here. Uh, well, we do, but they're not the same size. They're, they're totally different here. Um, and also our coronet fish have not seen lionfish before. Um, larger lionfish consume smaller lionfish as cannibals. So that has been observed. Um, many sharks are known to consume noxious or venomous prey with no obvious signs of ill effects. So some sharks can tolerate um, the, the lionfish and they are opportunistic, so they perhaps will eat them. Um, but divers are feeding lionfish to groupers and eels in hopes that they will become a part of their diet. There is no conclusive evidence that top predators can learn to prey on lionfish, but they can learn to get a quick snack from that diver. So that's really all you're teaching them. There are some dive sites now where, um, like in the Caymans, the Nassau grouper will take you to the lionfish and ask to be fed, but they are not getting it themselves. They're, they're like puppy dogs. They're lazy. They want to be taken care of. In the Bahamas, I know I've heard some stories where it was so hard to remove the lionfish because the sharks were going after the containment devices. Okay, they, they, so they've been trained to associate humans with food now and in an uncontrolled way. It's not like the shark feeding where they're controlling the, the setup of, of, of how they're feeding the sharks. This is just you're hunting and the sharks are getting snapped. Um, so this is not a behavior that we want to encourage in areas because it makes it harder for us to dive safely. Um, so we don't want to be eaten by a moray eel or get bit by a moray eel mistakenly. Also, this now answers that question. Do not remove lionfish spines on the boat. As, as someone who's worked as a dive master on a boat for a very long time, I used to yell at my divers. It was a pet peeve. Even if one spine stayed on the boat and somebody stepped on it, that's all it needs. These spines still contain the venom even after they're cut off. Okay? And so I would see divers cutting the spines. It's like, no, take that back to the dock. Either take, either leave this, take the spines off in the water um, while you're diving or leave them in the bucket, um, not the zookeeper, but your ice bucket, and then bring them back to the dock and take their spines off there on the fish cutting table. Um, so uh, remove the spines back at the dock, not on the boat. Uh, this happened to my friend Amanda, who was a dive master on scuba time. Somebody uh, brought up a lionfish on uh, a gun spear. It had a single point and he handed her the gun and, the, and it saw all the spines on it, and the lionfish slid down the pole onto her hand and stabbed her hand. And this is the morning trip. I immediately got a phone call that said she was throwing up, and she was not able to work the afternoon trip, so I had to work for her, which is fine. I mean, I, I don't mind working, but um, I love diving. But, uh, like, you know, the spines do not belong uncontained on a boat. It's very easy to cause these envenomations, and people don't get it because they've never been stung yet themselves. This is a very big deal. It's my big pet peeve. Um, all right, so what can you do? Get involved. Join a group. This is just from Facebook. I put in lionfish. You can see there's a group called Lionfish Hunters. Um, there's Florida Lionfish Derbies or Lionfish Hunters of Florida. So there's a lot of social um, uh, meetups and avenues to um, – let me – yeah, a lot of social meetups and avenues uh, uh, to participate in these lionfish removal events. Um, all right, this is what um, Nicole was saying at the beginning. Uh, June 11th, from 12 to 4, um, in Boynton Beach, there is a big lionfish derby. Um, and uh, it's at the Boynton Harbor Marina. And I think you need to have a partner or buddy to do it, correct? Um, oh, we'll, but, or we'll carry you. Oh, okay. You, all right. So um, 4C is helping to sponsor it. And so it's a, if you want to get out there after practicing and hearing this, it's a big derby competition. And these events are important. This is where we make an impact and we're able to remove the most lionfish. Um, and we want to keep these things going. Um, so work on your lionfish skills. And this is the first upcoming derby event um, of the summer that's local. They just had one a few weeks ago up north. Um, and if you don't, if you don't go and do the dive, you can come down to the marina after the dives, and they'll have presentations about lionfish, oh, good. filleting. They'll have um, booths doing vendor stuff. They'll have live music, um, food, stuff like that. I think Flow Grown is sponsoring it too, right? Uh, maybe. Um, all right. So. Um, all right, so participate in local lionfish removal events or get certified with a distinctive patty specialty as an invasive lionfish tracker with 4CE. Um, so I have a lionfish dive planned for this Sunday, 
and we're already sold out on it. And it's just to, you know, for people who already experienced or um, want to go for their first time, it's also a reef cleanup. We do uh, them once a month. Well, once a month. Yeah. And so the reef cleanups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. And, Oh, the line. Okay, yeah. So great, and um, uh, it's it's. So we've already booked that boat. It's we want to continue these events. We want to do it once a month, because this is how we control the lionfish. And then you can actually get a patty specialty out of it if uh, if you want as well. We uh, I'm a, a patty instructor, and I teach that specialty here at 4C. Um, all right, it's also the 2022 lionfish challenge time, um, and 4C Pompano here, where you are, is a checkpoint for um, your entries with these lionfish. FWC through the uh, Reef Rangers has an ongoing um, sort of removal challenge. Um, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission annually hosts a lionfish challenge to encourage anglers to remove the invasive species in Florida waters by offering prizes for the most lionfish harvested. Um, the 2022 challenge be uh, began May 20th and it runs through September 6th. The summer long tournament, um, which is now in its seventh year, is open to competitors around the state. You have to pre-register. You can go to fwcreefrangers.com. Um, and the FWC's goal remains the same, encourage anglers to remove as many lionfish as they can in just 3.5 months. So you'll bring your lionfish in here to be recorded and then it'll get entered. And, um, and you can go on the website and see some previous winners and they give lots of prizes. Um, so it's a fun thing for the summer. Um, so there are lots of outreach and control programs throughout the Caribbean. There's lionfish cookbooks. They've come out, tried to come with lionfish traps and cages. Um, this is that lionfish uh, special flag I was talking about to show that you're experiencing if you're like in the MPA. Um, some people have certified uh, in some of the islands core um, uh, through St. Thomas. Uh, and it's also, I think in Belize now, um, has been doing some lionfish permitting removals. Now this is a problem in the Mediterranean. Um, where I remember I said that we're trying to apply the lessons learned from the Western Atlantic to the Mediterranean. Um, a lot of those countries like Turkey and Israel, I mean, their their governments are uh, don't allow people to bring spears into the water at all. And it's harder to work with those government agencies. Um, so they're completely off limits. So we, if we can't spear them, it's going to make it harder to control the invasion there. Um, so some of this is a coordinated government effort to get them involved into the removal, um, but they have permitted, I think Turkey has permitted a, 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 a set number of divers with a special license to go out and remove the lionfish. This is how it started in the Caribbean. They used to just give certain people licenses to do this, like in the Caymans. Um, these are some lionfish derbies. You can see that there, uh, how many we caught, and I stopped after 2013, but we, there's usually prizes for the most, the largest and the smallest at the derby events. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so what is needed? Government supported co coordinated management, continue to promote lionfish hunting tourism and public education and outreach to control the size of local lionfish populations. Allow harvest in MPAs with pole spears. Encourage recreational tournaments. Encourage commercial fisheries. Um, not every area of the reef needs to be controlled for removal to be successful. Like in the flower garden banks, they can only go there, I think, like twice a year to remove the lionfish. And they have actually measured a, a, a greater abundance of native species and a decrease of lionfish in just those types of control efforts. Um, we need deep water traps for unreachable habitats. Maybe that's where our Roomba um, <laughs> lionfish collector can, can find its niche. Um, but their local removals are still the most effective. You can do adopt a reef program where that's your reef you go to all the time and just keep that area clean of lionfish. Remember, eradication is unlikely, but control can be a highly successful approach to minimize the impact. Um, effectiveness over as we do this should continue to be monitored and quantified to show results. Um, and one of my favorite guys, Charles Darwin, gave a forewarning. What havoc the introduction of any new beast of prey must cause in a county before the instincts of the indigenous habitats have become adapted to the stranger's craft or power. So this is sort of him without knowing invasive uh, species science, realizing that if a new species, uh, uh, species was not adapted to its environment, it would take time before any of the habitants became adapted to that new species as well. In other words, invasive species are a big problem um, to the native ecosystems and that have not yet adapted with it. Um, these are some uh, resources. Um, you can go to NOAA, USGS, Reef, FWC, and these are my just my references. Um, what, uh, that's it, guys. Any questions? Very good. Thank you so much for taking for staying here with me and.
I'm learning all about the lionfish removal efforts. I appreciate that. Um, then thank you for giving me all your attention this whole time. Are there any questions online? No, That's you guys okay. got them all. And, thanks, uh, guys. Thanks, you guys, for tuning in. See right, ya. Right, bye. Thanks. So.